Welcome to Rick's Corner. I have Dr. Bronstein back. You guys have asked for him over and over, and I've finally got him out of his practice to come give me some time. And um, you wanted to talk about pain medications. Yeah, so today I was telling Rick I made a list of eight topics or so and had my personal assistant pick two. And I thought prescription narcotic addiction was timely. Um, oh, there's a huge, as you know, a huge heroin addiction problem, especially on the East Coast, and particularly in small towns. Yeah, why is that? I th well, there's all kinds of theories. Like, you know, like the teenagers are bored. There's there's a high risk of un a high risk of being unemployed. Uh, the economy is not so good. Uh, people are hoping to get out of these small towns and find a job. Right. In the meantime, you can picture how those are risk factors. Uh, in Canada, it's a problem. In small towns, anyhow, you wonder well, why is there a, a heroin a, a heroin addiction problem? In fact, even in South America, some of the, uh, well, many of the marijuana growers are switching to growing heroin. It's more profitable now because there's a bigger need for heroin. Yeah. And so I remember as a teenager, uh, I'm 57, so as a teenager, uh, not, I don't remember any heroin problem. I don't, I knew nobody that used heroin. No, you know, I was a teenager and I heard about heroin. It was like one of those things you don't want to talk about. If he's on heroin, he's a gangster. He's in, should be in jail. You know, it's had a bad stigma to it. Right. It was like, it was like your criminality to it. Exactly. Like, picture maybe the hardcore gang members yeah. maybe right. shooting up heroin or smoking, whatever they did. Well, that's what they showed in health classes. Pretty yeah. much. Now, it turns out the history of narcotics, which is heroin, heroin, they're all derived from opium poppies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, goes back far into, in fact, it was legal in the United States to, to use narcotics, as probably a lot of you know, up until the 1930s, and then it became regulated by the government. And some narcotics even snuck their ways in various means after that, but back in the 1830s and 40s, the doctor would come with a little black bag, he might have dilated. There were, there were all kinds of narcotic preparations that they had to soothe pain and discomfort, and it's a cough suppressant, so cough syrup. Um, uh, it, it could be used maybe for treating depression, mm -hmm. as some antidepressant, anti-anxiety uses. But now, uh, with 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 the problem we have these days, uh, the the narcotics are so strong. It's not like they had in the 1800s. These are much stronger narcotics that are synthetically. Mm -hmm. Concentrated like oxycontin, oxycodone, dilatin. What's, what's the difference between the two of those? Oxycontin, and oxycodone. Well, so originally the, the the narcotics were shorter acting. So Tylenol with codeine. Okay. Codeine three four hour uh, in the body and it's gone more or less. Yeah. So people made a way to extend release it. You know, they put in different capsules and different types of time release waxy substances that would yeah. break there. And that's when oxy oxycodone, oxycontin came along. And that's when the real problem <clears throat> began in America. And doctors, myself included, were heavily, heavily pressured to prescribe this drug. Now, not for people with cancer pain, which was what we used it for only before that. Yeah for chronic low back pain, knee mm -hmm. pain, any pain. And we were threatened with even the thought of going to prison if we undertreated pain, let alone that being malpractice. So law, the threat of lawsuits, prison, if a patient complained you undertreated my pain and ruined my life, you could sue someone for wow, that. Wow, I had no idea. So there was a huge pressure and then we were re-educated. And the government allowed the drug companies to put on this huge re-education program for doctors, so the drug companies like Purdue, others that manufactured OxyContin, OxyCodone, they're just time release forms of morphine, would come to the office several times a week with drug reps, and they, of course, they're all beautiful, and they, they, they free luncheons, dinners, educational classes. Right. And the educational classes, I went to quite a few because we had to, to maintain our license mm -hmm. and, our, and maintain our special our board certification for especially, we had to go to these certain number of hours per year. And the first thing they would ask is anybody raise your hand if you think that oxycodone or oxycontin or narcotics are addictive in chronic pain patients. And so we all thought they were before. Yeah. So now we raise our hand and the guy just says no. And this is you know the world expert from anywhere, UCLA, Harvard, pick a place, Mayo Clinic. 
and these are pain management specialists that write all the textbooks. They say no and against, you know, it's a rare, rare occurrence that someone becomes addicted who has chronic pain. Well, now we know, and we knew back then too, that's not true. The risk is extremely high. Yeah, I would imagine it would be. It's gigantic. It's it's become an epidemic. So, so back then, you can see how, you know, the, the drug companies putting tremendous political pre financial pressure, donating lobbyists, what have you, pressure on the polit politicians, convince them that this is an important thing to educate doctors so they prescribe more. Yeah. And the drug reps usually literally come by and say, you know, they keep they can track how many prescriptions you write a week just by following different identification numbers. They come out with a list and say, hey, Dr. Bronstein, look, your your numbers are down. That's the term always, your numbers are down, like you did something wrong. Yeah. It was punitive. How come you're not prescribing more oxycodone or oxycontin? Look, doctor, and they have all the doctors in the community, look, Dr. X, he's prescribing three times as much as you. And this is whether they're making money. Yeah. And they keep track of pharmacies as well, how many pharmacies distribute X number of pills. So it's like a, <clears throat> almost a conspiracy. It is a, cons a type of can conspiracy by the drug companies to yeah. to uh, sell as many oxycontin and oxycodone pills etc as possible <clears throat> and so now 15 years later the the lectures we go to are people pointing the finger and saying hey Bronstein how can you're prescribing oxycodone oxycontin is like well you told me to yeah exactly because the government told me to with the threat of losing my medical license if I didn't with the threat of jail even um, uh, malpractice cases for under treating non-cancer pain but now they're telling me hey you, you treat you look at you got a bunch of drug uh, what are you doing and, and doing exactly what I was taught to do yeah, that's so typical though exactly oh well, yeah so that's the problem and so when you read these articles in the, in the whatever newspaper on the news doctors are prescribing too much oxycodone it's a root cause of heroin addiction well that finger I'd be pointing back at the White House, at the at, at the Congress and the Senate, and some of those older senators are still sitting there that voted in favor of the stuff and, and had lobbyists come to their office. And that's the root cause of all this illness, really, is lobbyists on K Street. There's a street called K Street in D.C. I used to live there. That's where all the lobbyists' offices are. So drug companies, they have permanent offices there, and they're within walking distance of the Capitol and the White House mm -hmm. and where the Senate is. And these these lobbyists are almost all lawyers. They're almost all originally attorneys. And now they start at about a million dollars a year salary plus bonuses as a starting salary. And and they go try to, they're hired by big companies to go and speak and, and, and urge congressmen and senators to vote for certain things like, for example, oxycodone, oxycontin for non-cancer pain. So, you know, if you think of the root cause of a lot of bad decisions in D.C., including this one, lobbyists. Oh, if yeah. If we lobbyists, we wouldn't have half the problems we have in this world. There's so much that, that goes on, we don't even know about it. But let me ask you a question. For example, a lot of my viewers out there, they work out hard. They get injuries. They have knee problems, back problems, shoulder problems, neck problems. You name it. They've got it. I've got it. And <clears throat> there's only so many things you can take to max the pain. Right? Right. So if I'm on blood thinners, and maybe some of them are, you know, because we've been through this, I can't do ibuprofen, I can't do Voltaren, I can't do Mobic, I can't do Celebrex, or any of those things that will cause me to bleed more. Right. So the only other end result is Tylenol. Well, there's ice, heat, rest. Well, I was going to do that. Elevation. But, but Tylenol doesn't do anything for me. Right. Ice helps a lot for the moment. Uh, of course I rest and of course I do those things, but there's joint pain and there's arthritis. And so what do you do for arthritis when you have that pain? Right, so other than Tylenol, um, number one is pain is a large cultural component too. I was saying how uh, I, I see, I, I went to the oral surgeon to get a tooth pulled. I'm trying not to show up. Uh, we can do that right here actually. <laughs> <laughs> right over here. Yeah. And um, I had a bone graft put in. And so um, as he's telling me about the, his training, he said, you know, he did a training qu quarter in, in Switzerland. And in Switzerland, down in the oral maxillofacial surgery department, a lot of doctors <clears throat> are German. And their philosophy is that they taught him that we don't give pain medications. Yeah. So with oral facial surgery, reconstructive surgery, wisdom teeth, pulling any teeth, and that's no pain medication. They just tell the patient, hey, look, pain is part of the healing process. It'll go away when you get better. 
in America, we've learned somehow to fear pain. Mm -hmm. If I think part of the psychology, if you maybe if surgeons told the patient, "Look, you're going to have pain," it's, that means your body's healing. It's a sign. It's a signal. People wouldn't be so afraid of it, and and maybe they would need less pain medication. Well, I think it's the discomfort of it all. Like I told you, I'm going to have a knee replacement in November. I know it's going to hurt. I have a very high tolerance of pain. Right. I know the first couple of days is going to hurt. I'm going to go to ice. I don't want to use the oxycodone and those things because they are addicting. They do constipate you and they do make you in another world. And they're expensive. Yeah, and I don't want to go through that. You know, I mean, I'll do whatever I need to do. If if I'm off the blood thinners, I think I can do a leave maybe. Um, but the, 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 you gave me this medrol pack. Remember we just talked about that. Yes, that really helped me a lot. And it's it, it's not like an anti-inflammatory that's going to affect my blood thinners, right? Right. So cortisone has a lot of side effects. You can use it periodically. Yeah. It's like anything in life. If you do it within, with, with, with caution, occasionally it's probably okay. Yeah. Some people take it once; they have a bad side effect; they get psychotic. You know. But but it, it's another option, right? Yeah. Cortisone shot pills, what have you. Well, the, the pills I know in the shot acupuncture. too. Acupuncture. Whenever I yeah, I do acupuncture. Whenever I get the cortisone shot or the pills, I know for the first two days, I feel kind of like um, spacey. And I get kind of flush. And I just feel kind of like oh, over here somewhere. Is that normal? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's actually not a bad feeling, but there's no pain in my joints for sure. I can walk like a regular guy. Yeah. Um, so, so probably if you look at some of these ancient tribes, how do they tolerate chronic pain? They must get osteoarthritis and osteo. Oh yeah. You know, hip arthritis, knee, and, and they can't stop walking or they die. They have to continue to hunt and gather food. How do they deal with pain? They probably just don't mention it. It could be. They, or they probably do. just. A lot of people would recommend herbs and acupuncture. Yeah, and I always tell people with pain imagine how much less pain you'd have. If, you, if I just told you you won the lotto and you won $100 million, wouldn't you have a lot less pain for the next half hour than yeah. if I told you you just lost 100 I mean, yeah. picture that. It, it, the, the art of distraction is huge. Well, um, I stubbed my toe one night on my bed and, and broke it, and my shoulder pain went away. Yeah, childbirth, another, oh, there you go, another childbirth, another example. A lot of women go through childbirth with no pain medication. Yeah. And yet it's supposed to be the worst pain yeah. anyone can experience. Yeah. Explain that. Well, they're anticipating the birth of a child. Sure. So they can so there's, tolerate the, there's the good side to that. Yeah. So what's the solution to all this? Well, another, well, to address the risk factors for opiate addiction is one, to maybe have a different educational approach to <clears> pain. So, so, I was just going to mention the risk factor for opiate addiction. The biggest ones are childhood trauma. Now, when I was in med school, nobody knew this. At least nobody discussed it. The, and there's now childhood trauma scores. So you supposedly, you know, if you if you have someone that might have need pain medication that's addictive for chronic pain, you can there's a standardized form you can have fill out and show them well your childhood addictive potential from childhood trauma is high. And maybe you wouldn't give that person narcotics. So there's yeah. there's some things, some interventions that that you can do like that. Also education that that pain doesn't kill you. That a lot of people have chronic pain because they're if you if you look at who these people are, they have depression, mm -hmm. untreated depression. They have um, boredom. Mm -hmm. So they're taking it for recreation. They're, yeah, they're not active. I mean, how many people that are CEOs of big companies? are complaining about chronic pain all day and rubbing their shoulder and their knee and mm -hmm. and not going to meetings and very few you know right. they probably just ignore it work through it go home and then they complain right you know, they their mind is elsewhere ice and put elevated and they, but all day long they're working their mind is elsewhere yeah the art of distraction it's huge in the meantime we have a government that's two-faced or more that 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 always will be and always has been that that on the one hand urges you to do one thing when you do it they go wait look what happened you're doing the thing we told you to do and it's a disaster and it's your fault yeah this happens in a lot of things yeah well that's very interesting and um in closing where can we find you as far as that? so uh well my i do deal with some chronic pain mostly taking people off pain medication but I'm not a specialist in that area. I just it, all doctors deal with. My office is in Sherman Oaks, okay. and I work alone and have a private practice out there. Um, there are fewer and fewer private physicians in, in the United States, and 
I'm one of the survivors so far. Why is that? Well, again, the government, um, the way the health care systems are regulated there, with Obamacare, there, which is a complete disaster, um, it, it, um, incur it, it discourages private practice. They want you to go to a group where, you know, five-minute visit, you're just a number, you're not a person, mm -hmm. with a, you're not an individual, you're just a, a, a body. That's getting care, and you five minutes, and you're out. And that's that's the approach our government takes. Yeah. What they've done is instead of elevate the part of the country that wasn't getting health care to a higher level, they do what they often do, like with the school system. They dummy everything else down to meet that lower level, and that's our current administration. Mm -hmm. uh, they they it's a mentality. It's a it's a ment it's a it's a it's terrible. You know, in a school, for example, why would you not raise the other kids up to a higher standard? Exactly. Why would you dumb everyone else down so that the, everyone else looks right. doesn't feel so bad? Right. It's a crazy mentality, and school certainly was not that way. And then they mess with the insurance now. Yeah, so they've done that with the healthcare system. They take the world's best healthcare system, then they say, hey, it's not the world's best. Look, if you look in Detroit, it's not that good. And they point to impoverished areas, go, look, it's number 52. Well, it depends what street you point to. Most of the streets you point to, it's number one. If you take number the worst neighborhoods in the country that need to be cleaned up, which our government won't allow us to do, yeah, of course they have the worst health care mm -hmm. in, in, in Skid Row, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But that's a, an exception. Other countries, it's the entire country. You point to the whole country and say, they have terrible health care with the exception of maybe a block. Yeah. Like in Cuba. Yeah. yeah. Maybe there's one little block where it's like Rodeo Drive. They get good health care. The rest of the country's in sh shambles. I never knew all this. This is very interesting. Yeah. Well, I didn't, had no idea. Well, I guess I'm lucky I have health care. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. We're going to do more. And uh, thank you guys for watching Rick's Corner and having the doctor back. He has always good enlightening stories to tell about what we're going through with our lives right now. And this affects every single one of us with the health care, with the pain, with the medications, because we're all doing the same thing. And this brings a lot to the table. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. See you next time. Bye. Drayson.com. He is the equalizer, baby. See you next time.